sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. During the time that we now call the Battle of Dunkirk, there was a British officer over in France, Dunkirk, who sent a three-word telegram. Three-word telegram. And in those three words, the message was, but if not. But if not. And it was understood back in England. What does that mean? Well, we'll see in tonight's uh, lesson as we look at Daniel chapter 3. We'll, we'll pick up later on that, that point. Return, if you would, to the Word of God. Hear now the Word of God in Jesus' name as we read Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. Now, you remember, of course, that King Nebuchadnezzar, he's the king of what we now know as, as the rock. That's what we call it now. It's the land of the Fertile Crescent, the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates. This is the land that Abraham came from, just filled with idols and idol worshipers. And so that's why God called, the one true God called Abram to go west. And then he made him Abraham, the father of many nations, but revealing to Abraham that there's only one God. And then, of course, we learn through the fuller revelation that that one God is in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But here, Nebuchadnezzar sets up this idol for all the people to worship, including the Jews who have been exiled. Remember, they came and they attacked the Jewish people. First, there was the, the were the, the ten tribes of Israel who were attacked by the Assyrians for punishment for their idolatry. And then God kept warning the people of Judah for about 100 or 200 years. And finally, he had enough, and Nebuchadnezzar came. And Nebuchadnezzar even destroyed the temple and then took a lot of people to be exiles in Babylon. And three of those exiles are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That wasn't their Hebrew name. That was their Babylonian name. So here's the context. King Nebuchadnezzar, that was the context. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. Uh, some commentators said that perhaps the name of the idol that was on the very top of it was Nabu, who Nebuchadnezzar is ultimately named after. Could be. Makes sense. In any event, uh, here was this idol. It was set up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned all the different government officials, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other, all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. Nobody is excluded, including the Jews. O peoples, nation, and men of every language, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Of course, this would be a direct violation of the first two commandments. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, and do not make any graven images unto me and worship that graven image. Uh, so, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews 
whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to bow down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, No, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from your hand, O king. But if not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, were there not three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? Mm -hmm. They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wow, what a, an amazing piece of... Uh, scripture here, this amazing account of what happened. It's interesting that sometimes Bible uh, critics, some of the liberals through the centuries that have, that have assaulted the Word of God, many of them have done so with the premise and the understanding that the miraculous is not possible. So they're, they're looking at the Bible and saying, well, you know, whatever happened, it couldn't have happened the way the Bible is actually, you know, lays it out. But if this wasn't a real event, if this didn't really happen the way, you know, it, it reads, then it's meaningless. It loses all of its power and all of its punch if this wasn't a real uh, event. Is he okay? Yeah, yeah, low blood sugar. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So he's going to 
Michael's going to check that around and we appreciate that. So anyway, what, what happened though was here is a real life example where somebody's faithfulness to the Lord was put to the test. Would they or would they not do this? Now, first of all, let me say this. Be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Uh, this was an ancient mode of punishment among the Chaldeans. And apparently there was even a tradition that Abram, that is, Abraham, was cast into such a fire by the idolatrous people because he would wor not worship their idols. But we don't know that for sure. And obviously he survived if, if such a thing happened. And... Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar calls these men in because he wants to make sure and give them the benefit of the doubt. Did I really hear for, for sure that these guys aren't going to do it? Now, it's interesting. What was the means that they used to call all the people to attention to worship the statue? Music. It's interesting that in our hymnal, if you turn to the hymnal, I noticed this, this uh, just this evening as we were looking at the different things. Martin Luther as a minister of the gospel, did so much to get the word of God into the people's language and tongue so they would understand that the just shall live by faith. But he also did a lot to get music into our hands. And so not only did he write some hymns, such as the Mighty Fortress is Our God, or also uh, the hymn uh, that we use at Christmas time, you know, uh, the, what was that? Away in a Manger. And uh, was the ACLU's favorite version of the hymn is uh, away with the major. But anyway, uh, Martin Luther said this. He said this, and this is right in the forward. He said, next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. The gift of language combined with the gift of song was given to man that he should proclaim the word of God through music. That's right in the forward that I, I was reading that sentence. And it's about in the middle of the page, if you're interested in, in looking at that. But the interesting point is the idea that music can be used for praising God, but music can also be used in other ways, obviously other avenues, including promoting you know, pagan revelry. And by the way, why don't we just take a moment and we'll pray uh, for it. Should we pray for it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right, good. And Pastor Beam, we'll, we'll check in. Lord, we lift up our brother to you. He's been so faithful through the years, and we just ask you, God, that uh, if, you, if there's any serious problem, Lord, that you would touch his body and that you would restore him back to good health. Thank you so much for him, Lord. Thank you for his faithful service. And uh, it's amazing, too, that even when his wife died, there he is as a widower, still faithfully serving your church mm -hmm. do all this and we praise you and thank you for that help us lord all to be faithful just like we saw and see that shadrach meshach and abednego were faithful even if it meant they were almost going to be killed so we praise you and thank you for that in jesus name amen mm -hmm. through the years through the centuries different faithful christians have been called to be martyrs Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could easily have had that experience, and they were willing to do it. Matthew Henry points out they did not go out of their way to court martyrdom, but when they were duly called to the fiery trial, they acquitted themselves bravely. So they made sure that they weren't going to hesitate. When he called them in, they didn't say, you know, well, let us think about it. Uh, well, let's pray about it. No, they said, no, we won't do it. We will not bow down and worship this. And Nebuchadnezzar, as Matthew Henry quoted, he said, Nebuchadnezzar can but torment and kill the body, and after that there is no more that he can do. Then they are out of his reach, delivered out of his hands. As Martin Luther put it in the hymn, A mighty fortress is our God. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. Are you feeling better? Yes. Okay, good. Well, praise, the Lord. praise the Lord for that. We, we are grateful. Now, in verse 17, uh, Adam Clark, one commentator, noted that if you look, let's go to verse 17 here. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I think this is probably the meatiest verses of the whole passage other than the miraculous uh, deliverance that they experienced. But they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, they said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. <laughs> Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O King. But if not, we want you to know, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. It's nothing personal, King Nebuchadnezzar. It's just, this is the way it is. We cannot worship anybody but the Lord God. And that's very important. Adam Clark said this, Render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's. That's, of course, what Jesus said. This is the maximum of Jesus. But when Caesar arrogates to himself the things that are the Lord's, mm -hmm. then, and in such cases, his authority is to be resisted. God does not desire Caesar's things. Caesar must not have the things of God. In the King James, verse 18 reads this way, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And uh, so I want to read a little bit about those words, but if not. And I mentioned to you a telegram. Here's one uh, writer was noting this. He said, up until the 20th century, nearly the entire English-speaking world used the King James Version, or translation of the Bible. We all shared a common text. People were also more biblically literate than most are today. So if you quoted a Bible verse, people would usually recognize the reference. In American history, we have a great example of that. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln said that everybody knew. He's just quoting from Jesus Christ. <laughs> Today, people think, wow, Abraham Lincoln, he was so wise. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, he's just quoting Jesus. Anyway, Bible <laughs> stories like those in the book of Daniel were very familiar. In the summer of 1940, there were about 350,000 soldiers, British and French, mostly British, that were trapped at Dunkirk, which is on the northern coast of France, near the English Channel. Why don't they call it the, the English-French Channel? Anyway, it's near the English Channel. The German forces were on their way. They could easily wipe out all those people. That's what the whole movie, Dunkirk, is about. And it's uh, kind of a... a it's in the theaters now. I saw it. It's the last time I saw a movie in a long time since one of the Christian ones, The Gates of Christ. Is. Anybody seen the Dunkirk? Yeah. It's good. Yeah, it's, it's worth it's worth going to see, I think. It's, it's hard, though. It's hard because, you know, it shows a lot of war. Okay, the German forces were on their way. They had the capacity to wipe them out. When it seemed certain that the Allied forces on Dunkirk were about to be massacred, a British naval officer sent a three-word telegram back to London. But if not, it's quoting directly from the King James Version of uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. These words were instantly recognized to the people who were accustomed to hearing the scriptures read in church. They knew this story behind it. The message was very clear. The Allied forces were trapped. It would take a miracle to save them. But they were determined not to give in one simple three-word phrase communicated all that. Now, I want to point out that uh, Gary DeMar, who's a commentator, said that the movie is good, but it does leave something out. They had a day of fasting and prayer, and they called people to come to Westminster Abbey. And he shows in his website, Gary DeMar does, a photograph of all these people lined up, and they're all lined on their way going into Westminster Abbey oh. for a day of prayer for Dunkirk. And the miracle of Dunkirk then happened where all these yachts and fishing boats and anybody with a sailboat or whatever, they went over for England to get the men who were trapped and they were able to rescue 338,000 men, Ooh. the British and the French, to, to be able to fight for another day. But isn't that interesting that even if they they weren't going to. They were going to be wiped out. They would, you know, it's like, no, we will not bow down uh, to Adolf Hitler. 
George Wolfe put it this way, in 1940, a British officer on Dunkirk Beach sent to London a three-word message. But if not, it was in, in, instantly recognized as from the Book of Daniel when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were commanded to worship a golden image or perish. They defiantly replied, our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from a burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. Britain then still had the cohesion of a common culture of shared reading. That cohesion enabled Britain to stay the hand of Hitler, a fact pertinent to today's new age of barbarism. That's what uh, Joseph, uh, George Will wrote. So it's very, very interesting. And when Nebuchadnezzar gets so furious and he has the, the furnace turned up even more, and even some of the soldiers delivering the men, uh, he is just absolutely amazed to see the angel of God deliver the three men. And then when they come out, they don't even smell like smoke. Have you ever, do you have a friend or relative that smokes, smokes cigarettes, and sometimes you're in their presence and it's like, oh, you know, you can smell it so bad. And yet these guys didn't smell like that. They didn't smell like they just came out of a bar or something with all the people smoking. By the way, aren't you glad for the indoor Florida law about smoking? Because, yeah. I mean, if you remember before what it was like, and even, I, I remember we went to Toronto one time, just about 15 years ago on a production trip, and they didn't have that kind of law back then. You go into a Dunkin' Donuts in Toronto, and it's like people are smoking. Wait, put that cigarette out, buddy. It, you know, it stinks. You know. But anyway, it was really an amazing thing that God delivered his people. But he could have chosen to have these people suffer, just like he had James suffer. James was put to death by Herod, but James wasn't any worse of a Christian. Stephen, who was the first martyr, whose name means crown, he was the first one, and he was stoned to death, and God did not spare him from that. God didn't spare Paul from being beheaded. He didn't spare Peter from being crucified upside down. Show us your shirt. Stand up and show us your shirt. Okay, you see right there on that shirt for the, the flag of Jamaica, and you have on there the two bars, just like you have, if this were the flag of Florida, we could look at that. You have something, what is that called? That yellow thing on her shirt. It's the cross of? St. Andrew. Of St. Andrew. St. Andrew, the brother of Peter, was crucified on a cross like an X, like this. And in the book of Fox's Book of Martyrs, it talks about how when, when St. Andrew was called upon to be crucified, and he said, I will not shirk from this. I have long been a scholar of the one who died for me, who was crucified for me. I will not shirk from this. And St. Andrew's cross is found in all kinds of different flags, even to this very day, including the flag of Florida. Don't tell the ACLU because you might say, you know, hey, that's unconstitutional. But, but it's true. It's true. It's absolutely true. One of the points of this chapter shows you that we should not always be blindly allegiant to the state if the state asks us to do something that would violate God's law. And that's an important point. Uh, during World War II, my wife was from Norway. I learned a lot about what happened when the Nazis took over Norway and controlled it from April 1940 to May 1945. Mm -hmm. And they took over the churches. They said, okay, we're going to implement, this is what you're allowed to say, this is what you're not allowed to say. They probably didn't let them preach on Daniel 3, I'll bet. <laughs> or, or, or Acts chapter 4, where you know Peter says, you know, judge for yourselves. We must obey God rather than men. And the Nazis took over the churches and they, they said, this is what's going to happen. And the pastors and the priests and the bishops, the all Lutheran church, church, they said, well, let's all unite and say, sorry, we won't agree to do this. And so the Nazis said, all right, fine, we'll send you to the concentration camp. So those pastors, priests, Bishops, they all went to concentration camps. Some of them never came back. They did the same thing with the schools. They took over the schools. 
All the Norwegian schools were taken over by the Nazis. And I have seen in a museum in Norway, in Oslo, Norway, this actual text. And Kirsty translated it for me. And it says, Romans 13. It's, it's Romans 13. It's the Nazis quoting from Romans 13. And they said, and I'm going to quote this. This is from an actual textbook given, you know, forced on the Norwegian people by the Nazis where they were quoting scripture. They said, what are those called in Romans 13, 1, who God has sent over us? Have you considered that your parents, your school teachers, your principal, policemen, police chief, judges, the priests, the sat, the bishop, the county commissioner, the state government, the satraps, the treasurer, the, <laughs> the magistrate, do you see what I'm going with this? Are the authorities who are installed by God and that you owe them obedience? Overall, we owe the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler in other words, and the government obedience. If you set yourself up against the authorities and against the state, you are standing against God's structure and are subject to punishment. Talk about the devil quoting scripture. Yep. Whoa. Now the late D. James Kennedy once wrote a letter in 1988 and I came across it. It was unpublished and I published it in a column and I'm quoting from it. But here's what D. James Kennedy said in reference to this whole idea of are there times where we must obey God rather than men? Yes, but this is not something to be entered into lightly because if the state forces you to disobey God, that's when it, it fits. So don't say, well, the, the speed limit here is 65, but I'm going to go 75 because I'm a child of God or something like that. Wait a minute. If it says 65, then you should go 65. You know, the, the state is our lawful authority. Uh, so that's one thing. But it's another thing if you say, hey, you're not allowed to talk about Jesus. Well, wait a minute. If, if I don't talk about Jesus, how are you going to get saved? How is anybody going to get saved? Here's what D. James Kennedy said on this issue. He said the basic Bible premises in reference to civil disobedience, like the rare cases for it, I believe are these. This is Dr. Kennedy quoting now. One, all authority is from God. Two, all human authority is delegated from God. Three, no human authority can countermand the authority of God. That's what those Nazis were doing in those Norwegian churches and schools. Four, if such anti-biblical laws are passed, Christians must in conscience disobey them. Five, they must be prepared to suffer the consequences of their actions, which is exactly what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What if not? And then finally, Dr. Kennedy said, the very existence of Christianity depends upon Christians obeying these principles. Had they not done so, Christianity, which was outlawed first in Israel and then in the Roman Empire, would have ceased to exist many centuries ago. I mentioned what the Nazis did with the schools and also that they took over all the pastoral authority in the churches. There are photographs of the churches during the Nazi time in Norway. Normally, people were worshiping and normally those churches would be full, at least back then. That's not true now, unfortunately, not, not on the same level. But during the war, Christians were often living, they were worshiping in their own homes, and they were, but they were not going to the official church because the pastor, the priest in charge of the church were just nasty students. So that's a very, very interesting thing. So, at the end of the day, it's important for us as Christians to obey the government. God has put the authority there. But also we must remember that obedience to God comes first. And so it's important for us to realize that. I want to close with part of the hymn we read from earlier today. When Martin Luther King finally got all those people in the march to Selma. They finally made it to Selma. Do you know what he did? The Baptist minister, Martin Luther King Jr., you know what he did? He read the words of the hymn that we sang the first verse of, Once to Every Man and Nation, which, by the way, 
were written by James Russell Lowell, who was a Harvard professor around 1900 in that zone. And in that hymn, Once to Every Man and Nation, listen to the third verse that Martin Luther King Jr. read, but that Christians have been singing for the last century or so. What a beautiful message this is. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet the truth alone is strong. Though her portion be the scaffold, and upon the throne be wrong. So in other words, the wrong person's being killed. Nebuchadnezzar is on the throne. The Jedrak, Meshach, and Abednego could have been killed. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Mm. And behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. May we pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us your holy word. Thank you so much, Lord, for the courage of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here we are 2,500 years later, just reflecting on their courage and their willingness to stand up for you at all costs. Lord, help us to be faithful in all things. There's so many little ways in which we can be faithless, and the consequences are not even close to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego face. And Daniel also, as we'll see in a later chapter, with the lion's den. But we praise you and thank you. We ask that we would obey you in all things. Make us faithful, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And receive now the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you all for coming. God bless you. Oh, and there's a cake. And there's a cake. Yeah. Let them eat cake. <laughs> Thank you, Lord.